Here's our last training in our three-part series with Michael Lawrence. He walks us through his low-variance system design and optimization approach for a recent arena tour, and he's going to share that. So part one and two talk about design and then processing. Now we're on to alignment. What was the data he saw in the field with this smart rig and how he was able to make sure that every single seat on his arena tour sounded amazing and had a similar experience. If you're unfamiliar with Michael Lawrence, he first off, he just released this new book, which you can get at the link below. Uh, it's between the lines, concepts and sound system design and alignment. Um, so if you know, all this stuff is, is really fun and fancy at a huge arena tour, we have a, over 100 boxes in the air, but all of this can trickle down and be helpful for to you, even if you're the weekend warrior, or working on corporate gigs or whatever, it, it's more so the methodology and mindset and decision making decision making matrix is the most important part. So definitely check that out at precision audio com slash book or at the link below. If you're unfamiliar with Michael Lawrence and his other work, well, you trust that guy. He's a senior instructor at Rational Acoustics. They, they make the software smart. He's a technical editor for multiple live sound magazines. He's worked with multiple A-level artists, and sometimes he gets asked to co-host AES panels with Bob McCarthy. So I'm grateful to have him today with me. He's a wonderful friend and mentor and very generous with his knowledge. So please make sure and check out the book. But if you would like a, a free ebook coffee copy of uh, of his book, you can enter to win that by leaving a comment below with your biggest aha moment or takeaway from this video. You can actually go back to the first design video and processing and alignment up your chances by leaving a comment on the, your biggest takeaway from each of the three. And after this one drops, I'll reply with the comment and let you know if you won and we'll get the details for you to get the coupon code. Anyway, thank you so much for being here. Super pumped to jump in and wrap up this series with Michael Lawrence with alignment. All right, we're here for part three of low variance sound system design and optimization with Michael Lawrence. If you have not caught part one and two, please and do that. We talked about the design phase, the processing phase, and now we're on to alignment. What was Michael's job day in and day out on this tour using the tools he had to make changes to the system so it sounded great in every single seat. So he's going to walk us through step-by-step step through that approach and how he made sure people were having a fantastic time in the nosebleeds as well as the front row. So thank you, Michael, for being here today. Looking forward to your approach. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, you know, and it's 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 funny to me, I guess, that a lot of people think this is... Uh, this is the most exciting part, but it's actually the least exciting part. You know, like if we've, if we've done the design well and we've got our processing together when you turn this thing on as we're going to see from the data, it's pretty close to where it needs to be. So uh, I think a lot of folks um, are, you know, obviously this step is, is extremely important. And so, so is the verification, you know, making sure that the rig is doing what it's supposed to be doing. So we don't ever skip this step, sure. but um you know, if you've created problems for yourself up to this point, they're not going to be solved now. Right. So uh, that's kind of, this is sort of the, this is sort of the putting the frosting on the cake stage and just making sure everything plays together nicely. Um, so let's, let's hop into that. Um, I talked about verification and honestly, this is, this is an area where our field needs to do better. Verification is something that we often skip because we're lazy or we are maybe too trusting. Uh, you know, I've been handed a lot of systems where left and right didn't sound the same. Yeah. Um, nobody checked or left and right were reversed, or you have six subwoofers and one of them's out of polarity because nobody checked. So, so before we tune a system, we want to verify the system. And that means making sure it's wired correctly, it's patched correctly. Everything's coming up in the right spot. All the loudspeakers are working. If I have 16 cabinets in an array, all those 16 cabinets should sound the same. And if they don't, maybe they've got a blown driver. Maybe they've got an amp that has a preset that I need to go check. Maybe I've forgotten left some processing in from the last show, but we want to give ourselves a clean slate when we go to do our tuning, we want to make sure that we don't have problems in the rig, right? Because if we have blown our drivers, we've got stuff wired out of polarity. We can't fix that with EQ. We can't fix that with processing. We need to make sure that the rig is in good working order. So that's what we call a verification process. And I would say that more often than not, a verification process will reveal a problem. So don't skip this. Do yourself a favor and go through the verification. Just check everything first. What you're seeing here is what we call a mic verify. And it's the same idea. Bef what we're going to do is take our measurement mics and we're going to move them around the audience and we're going to make measurements and we're going to make some judgment calls based on the differences we see in those measurements. So before we do that, we have to make sure that our mics are actually matched because if you're starting off with mics that don't measure the same, you are then going to be making judgment calls that you shouldn't be making because you didn't bother to check your mic. So uh, I took a little 
a little talk box loudspeaker there and just taped all the mics together so they would be in close proximity and uh, did a mic verify. And so what you're looking for here is not a one or two dB variance at 8K. What you're looking for is an obvious difference in magnitude. You're looking for a difference in polarity. You're looking for a difference in sensitivity, something like that. You know, different measurement mics are going to have different sensitivity. So you want to set your gain pots on your interface to make sure that they're all overlaid. So we're, we're looking for uh, a, a damaged or broken microphone is going to be weeded out by this process. Uh, so that's the mic verify. Um, so now let's get into the, the, the tuning of the system. Uh, it's let's the verification process. Um, you know, what I would start is routing the smart signal generator to the entire PA. Everything's muted. I would unmute one box at a time, spray all the way down, every hang, every sub, every font fill, just making sure sound comes out of the box. And that's done before the arrays at height. You can see here it's floating. The rigors have not flown it to or excuse me, my techs have not flown it to, to height yet. So it's floating off the ground. And before they're ready to fly, they say, hey, Michael, we're ready for verification. And I'll come over and we'll test every box. Sometimes they've, you know, they might have switched some cabling when they were wiring it up, or we might have a box that didn't turn on or something like that. And so we want to catch that before it goes into the air. So when they're, they're flying and they're ready to go to height, we'll verify that side. And then I'll say, okay, it all looks good. And then they will go ahead and bring it to trim height. So that's the verification. Um, now the sub array is a thing that we only need to do once because as you can see, it's flown from that truss. So we're gonna set the timing once and then we're just gonna, again, verify that timing, verify that it's all correct um, as we go forward. So what we're trying to do is make a cardioid array. It's louder in the front, it's quieter in the back. So one of the things that I would do during verification is turn on the rear hang and then turn on the front, front hang, make sure it got louder in front. Because if they had accidentally wired those two backwards, it would get quieter yep. instead of louder. Um, so, so we're making sure that the, the, those are wired correctly and it's steering the right way. Um, the reason that we did this alignment at, at floating height, and this is our first uh, show here in Reno. We went into tech it in, in, in Reno. And so we want to do this timing before the rig's up in the air. Once the rig is up in the air, to get on access to those subwoofers, we need to go all the way back up to the back of the venue, the last row where they're pointed. And then you're going to be pretty far away and you're going to have a pretty tough time getting clean data back there. So mm -hmm. although it is doable and we have some features in smart that make it a little bit easier, the best thing to do is to do it up close and personal. And so what I did is we did our timings here um, when the rig was just floating off the floor, like you see it here. So the first thing we want to do is put these into an end fire array. So we start an end fire array. Again, you start with the upstage box and they kind of fire from there. So the, the upstage box is what we're going to call our time zero box, or in this case, the upstage hang of, of seven boxes, right? Um, so I turn on that upstage hang by itself. Our measurement mic is out in front and fire is, is tuned from the front. And uh, the, first, uh, the first screenshot here shows the magnitude and phase of that, uh, that array, just the, the one hang out in the front. Um, and we're gonna set our measurement delay to that. You can see the phase trace is kind of flattened off around 63 Hertz. So that's where we're timed to. Um, so once we do that, that's sort of our baseline. We're gonna mute the upstage hang and we're gonna turn on the downstage hang and it's going to show up higher in magnitude as you can see on the bottom there because it's closer to our mic. Uh, and it also will show up you know, with a different phase response because it is uh, not been delayed yet. It's closer to us. So we add the delay until those phase traces overlay and you can see that they're nice and overlaid. Yep. Uh, that took about 4.2 milliseconds to do that. You want to have an idea going in of what that number should be. And your prediction software will help you discover that. It's not going to be exact because the prediction software can't calculate the, the wraparound paths around the boxes, but it should be close to a millisecond or two. So if my prediction said it should take 3.9 and I get into the field and it takes 7.8, I'm going to want to stop and figure out what's going on, right? So this part of that verification process and part of when we take a measurement, We've got an expectation of what we expect it to be. And if it's, if it's not meeting our expectation, we want to find out why. So once we've got our rare and our front sub time together, we can turn them both on and you can see the green trace. That's a textbook uh, 6 dB of addition there. Um, so that's summation going in the forward direction. And of course, in this case, if you want to go around the back and, and check out the attenuation, um, you can do that as well. So now we've got our end fire array going. So we're going to save that green trace. Um, now we want to time that to our mains. And again, this is something that the rigging point might move a couple inches forward and back from day to day. But for the most part, given the fact that our crossover frequency is going to be, you know, 80 hertz, and we're talking about a 12 foot wavelength down there, um, you know, 
a couple inches either way is not really going to disrupt that timing. And yep. so this is another thing where we can get this timing up in the near field and get it close during prep. And then as we move our show from venue to venue, just going to give it a quick checkup every day and make sure that it's uh, doing what it needs to do. So uh, we've got our subs on in the first slide. Then we add our mains. Now, this is another thing I talk about expectations. The mains here are at a lower level. They're about, look like they're about 6 dB down from the subs. And the first question you have to ask is, does this make sense? And in this particular case, the answer is yes, because this venue is small and we hang about half of our mains. So we're not hanging 16 over three. We're hanging, I think, I think we hung nine. Uh, so it's about half the rig. So it makes sense that the SPL is going to be lower when we turn it on. So it's just a mental check of like, yep, that that's mm -hmm. expected. Um, and you can see where, where we're crossing over there, uh, that, that frequency where they meet at equal levels, right around 80 Hertz. So at 80 Hertz is where we care the most that these things are playing together in their time together in their phase. And you can see the red trace and the phase trace. We've, we've added the delay until they are sharing the same slope there. So that's, that's a, the means and the subs are, are now in phase. And then the last slide, when we turn both of them on, you see again, that textbook build up right through that crossover range where they're, where they're playing together. So those become the base timings for our entire show. Um, and then as we go forward, I'm just checking that each day. And I don't think I, I actually made any changes to that um, throughout the show, uh, with the exception of there were a couple cases where we did not hang the Leos as mains. There were a couple shows where we hung the Lions as mains in the front um, for, for, for reasons that we'll talk about. Um, and obviously that's going to change your timing a little bit and it's a different box. And so we want to go through and, and just spot check that again. So that's how I did the alignment, if that makes sense. So that, that makes perfect sense. I, I, quick question about when you only had nine of your mains, did you still keep the seven and seven subs, even though you didn't need the SPL, but for the directivity? Yeah, exactly. Yep, exactly. Okay. We kept, we kept, and the, and the other thing is when you're on a tour and you're not using all your boxes, those boxes have to go somewhere. Um, and so a lot of times having, having those subs, you know, uh, in a, in a hallway or something, they really, there should either be an use or on the truck is yep. the way it's going to go. Uh, but yeah, the, obviously the directivity there and the steering is really important. So basically what we have at that point is headroom because yep. if it's yeah. too much sub, when we tune it, we're going to just turn it down or use EQ. We're just buying headroom. Um, and the other thing is that engineered structure, that trust in those clamps, and we know what the loading is. Um, mm. and I don't really want to mess with that. And yeah. taking subs off isn't shouldn't change the weight distribution, but I, you know, it's kind of more of a this was approved by the engineering department to be used like this, and so I'm going to use it like that. Um, yeah. And that's that's typically, you know, we wouldn't make a change to that uh, engineering without talking to the crew chief and if they needed to mm -hmm. call back to the office, just make sure that it was it was the way that it needed to be. And like I said, taking a box off is not is not typically a concern, but it's still something that for all those reasons, I'm not going to mess with it unless I've got a good reason to do so. So. Perfect. And you, you don't want to make more work for ourselves anyway. Right. So, <laughs> um, so let's talk about a checklist. What am I looking? What's my process for each day? Right. So the first thing, like I said, I'm going to verify each box on the rig, make sure it's coming on, make sure it sounds like it's supposed to sound, make sure everything's wired properly. And, you know, over the course of, of two months of shows, things break, right. Cables go bad. Uh, you might have a box that's not powering on or, or you blew a driver. We didn't blow up any speakers. Uh, we, we did really well. And, and all of those boxes, uh, Finish the finish the tour with us, and we didn't we didn't kill anything. But but you don't want to assume that, right? You never want to assume that everything's working fine because it was, you know, sure it was working fine yesterday. But then you took it down and disconnected it all and put it on a truck and bounced it around for three hundred miles, and then you hung it back in the air. So don't assume that something didn't go wrong in that time period, right? So we're gonna check them all. Another thing that I do that I it, that tends to surprise some people is every day I zero out my processing. I go in, I clear out all the shading, I clear out all the EQ. Um, obviously we talked about the timing. Those things are expected to stay. We leave that timing, but the shading, the EQ, I take out every day. I do not just push forward. A lot of people just push forward from day to day and kind of tweak it as they need to, to adjust to the new environment. Um, I find that it's better for me and it's better for my process to just clear it out and add the EQ that I need. Um, because it doesn't allow you to skip a step. It forces you to go through the process mm -hmm. of doing the correct EQ. And so, you get into a situation where it's really easy to go, that's close enough. And what's going to happen is your show's starting to creep over time. It's close enough to where it was yesterday. And the next day is close enough to the way it is today. And so 14 days from now, it, it's no longer the same. Yep. You creep a little bit over time and that affects front of house mixing and that affects the whole show creeping. So in order to make sure that the show is consistent, I would clear all that every day. 
I would load a save target trace from the first show. After we did our first show in Reno, I knew what the response of the system was. I saved that. And that becomes my target curve for the rest of the show. So for every show, that target curve comes back up and we tune in. I'm going to show you an example of that. Tune that rig back to that target curve, which again, different number of boxes, right? Different spaces, different trim heights. So we made a little bit of different EQ from day to day to get to that target curve. But we're always going back to that first target curve from that first show. So there's no creep. Love it. And that's, that's a really important thing that, you know, yeah. we talk about consistency over the audience. That's what we've been talking about this whole time. But also a really important thing is consistency for the mix engineer. Mm. They've got the same board mix that they did last night and they should turn it on and it should sound the same. So all the things we need to do to cover the space and the different system configurations still needs to sound the same in front of house. So by tuning the whole rig back to the same target every day that came from that first show, I'm making sure that that show 26 sounds like show one and we don't creep over time. Uh, and you could go into the saved smart data and you could load up measurements from eight different shows and, and stack them all on top of each other. And they're all going to have the same tonality. And that's, that's why that's done. Um, so uh, clear stuff out. We talked last time about how I do the LMBC parameters to make sure that that beam steering is doing what I want. Um, and then we start the measurement. So the mic verify, I take all four of my wireless measurement mics, put batteries in them, and I put them out sort of in sort of a, you know, beach ball sized area in front of one side, um, turn that on and make sure that all four of those mics are giving me the same answer, right? Um, when you've got wireless in the picture, you just, again, you want to check that's another variable that you've got mm -hmm. make sure that make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. You've got gain stages and all that. So just check those. Um, I will then tune one side of the system. And usually that was PA right, because PA right tends to be up first um, mm. because PA left can't typically go up. You know, the riggers have to get those points ready. And then we've got a cross stage run that has to go connect those processors to the other processors and carts got to push and video walls are coming in and out. So because of what the other departments need, open, open areas to push things through. And, and we can't always get that other side online as, as soon so I tune the one side and then I know that uh, when the other side goes up to trim, since my processes are linked, everything's going to follow along. Nice. Um, and again, we've learned to verify the system first. So we know that it's symmetrical, right? Uh, so I tune uh, my mains. We start with my mains and tonality and variance. So we want to hit our target curve. So overall EQ and variance. So my high frequency shading, again, we talked about that. I'm going to probably end up boosting on my top boxes and probably end up cutting on my bottom boxes make that high frequency consistent of front to back. So I'm just sort of doing two things at once here. I'm doing overall EQ and my shading. Once I've done that, bring our subs on and mains and subs together should bring me to that target curve, right? Um, once I said, okay, the main system, the main and the subs together, we're at our target curve. Cool. Um, now we take our mics and we go over to the side hang. Uh, and it's the same thing. I'm gonna treat just like the mains. It's got, we got two things we're doing. We have overall tonality and variance. And the, the thing is that we talked about this a little bit last time we spoke in the side hang custody area, those mains and subs are dumping a lot of low frequency energy over there. So, so when we talk about getting the side hang up to tonality, up to our target curve during the show, it's going to be on when everything else is on. Yep. So I needed to be at the target tonality with the mains and the subs on. So when I tune it, it's a little thin in the low end. And if you were listening to it by itself, it wouldn't sound correct, but you'll see when the whole rig comes back on, that stuff fills back in. Um, so we're always thinking about a fill as a fill and saying what's missing over here and what does this fill need to restore to bring us back to our target curve? Because if every individual box of system, every front fill and everything goes all the way down to 35 Hertz, it's not realistic, but if it could, when you turn it on, you've just got a big booming mess at low frequency. So we're really letting letting the big boys, the mains and the subs, create that low frequency energy and everybody else just adds what they need to add to get every individual custody area back to target. Does that make sense? Absolutely. No, it, uh, it's, it's making me think about uh, arranging for an orchestra. So like, you know, John Williams comes out with like a beautiful melody and you're deciding like, hey, we're not going to have the baritones try to be a tuba, you know, we're not going to have, or like the tuba is already holding down that pedal tone. So we, you guys say in your lane. And so just that subdivision of labor, not only from like crossovers and speaker sizes, but from subsystems is making a lot of sense for me in that context. 
Yeah. And, and the other benefit of that is since we don't need all the side hang to produce that. Now it's a side hang, but it's still 20 lions. It's a yeah. big array. So it's producing a lot of energy down in the low mid and the low region. And so if we're reducing what we don't need out of that, and we're at Target in its custody area, that means we're not dumping all that stuff out front because remember those mm. boxes are dumping that everywhere else too, right? It's not yeah. just the mains. The donut. So, exactly. So we're creating all these sources of low mid energy that we don't actually need in a lot of cases, uh, particularly in this show because those things are clustered so closely together um, that, you know, one a thing a lot of front of house engineers will say, turn the side hangs off during sound check because they don't want all that extra stuff blown over there. And on this rig, you couldn't tell. You know, our first sound check was like on, off, on, off. You couldn't hear it. It's cool. Because we had sucked out a lot of that stuff that would bleed out front. And, yep. and so that's based on a technique by uh, Jim Yakubuski called 360 degree tuning, where you're not just thinking about the front of the box, mm -hmm. you're thinking about the sides and the back. It's a perfect example of that. So the whole show gets a little bit tighter sounding everywhere because you don't have these sources just dumping, you know, 250 into your space. Um, mm -hmm. So once we turn on the side with the mains, with the subs, make sure that it does hit our target tonality. Um, then all we need to do is the stuff on the ground, the fills. And the thing about the fills is they're attached to the stage. So mm -hmm. day to day, the timing from fill to fill is not going to change. And the level mm -hmm. from fill to fill is not going to change. The only thing that's going to change is, is our stage forward or back compared to the flown system. Is the trim height different? Is the curvature different? So the front fill and the down fill, that relationship is what changes. Yep. So I can set the timing on my fill feed from my main front of house processor. If I adjust that timing, it moves all the stuff on the ground forward and back together. So they maintain their relative timing to each other, but I'm just tying in the flown system with, with the ground system. Yeah, it's a perfect scenario to capitalize what you said earlier about moving your decisions upstream. You moved it to like, this is just everything on the ground needs to be aligning here. So let's just go ahead and make the decision once instead of taking care of all those outputs. Exactly. So if I go, my front fills need to be delayed by three milliseconds, I could go into every single fill and add oh. three milliseconds to all of them. And you can do that in Galaxy pretty easily, to be fair. You can select them all and increase one value by three and they'll all increase by mm -hmm. three. So it, it is really nice. It's like a VCA. It tracks the relative changes yep. together, but I don't need to do that because mm -hmm. I've got a fills feed at front of house. I just add three milliseconds to that and everything stays together. Um, and so that's that, that's that tier processing really coming in handy there. Fantastic. And of course, the last thing we're going to do is we're going to put on our music and we're going to take a walk and we're going to listen and we're going to pay special attention to make sure that the, the other half, the side we didn't tune, sounds like the side we did tune. Um, and it should because we checked it before it flew, but things happen. Um, and then... You know, we're going to listen to the timing. We're going to listen to, you know, that area where the mains and the, uh, the mains and the side hangs overlap. You know, again, that's that's a timing that since the geometry doesn't really change, I set that once during prep, didn't really have to set it again because those points don't really move. But I'm going to walk that every day and make sure that it sounds OK. Yep. That's a nice, clean transition. Um, we're going to make sure that this, the delta plates are correct so we don't have any gaps in coverage. We're going to make sure that it's not too bright in the back. We're going to make sure it's not too bright in the front. You know, listen to our shading realistically speaking, by the time I've gotten to the walk, the stuff that I change is on the order of a dB or yeah. a millisecond. So you're very, very, very close to where you want to be. You're close enough that if you don't get a chance to walk, it's not a catastrophe. Mm -hmm. Now, I would never give up my chance to walk willingly. Sometimes the schedule is what it is and you just can't do it. And I hate handing off a PA I haven't listened to. Um, but this is another reason why we want to build confidence in our measurement tool. So even when we have a system like that, um, we can still say, I know this is very, very close to doing what it needs to do. But yeah, if you have that ability, once you can walk, um, I might change shading by a dB or two. And of course, at that point, you're into environmental variables. And so as, as the community of the room changes and people come in and out, uh, you're going to be readjusting that anyways. So um, that's the process. Um, so mm -hmm. if that makes sense, I think we'll go through and look at some of this data. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So here's a mic verify. Um, so you can see there's four mics there together. I've chosen the most obnoxious colors that I can find for the mic stands. Um, so I can find them because you're going to stick this thing up in a seat somewhere and it's going to be difficult to see. Um, so bright colors. And you'll notice my smart traces are the same colors as the mics that produce them. I totally um, ripped that off from you last week. I saw that you're, <laughs> I was like, that's brilliant. And I, I did that my last system tuning and it was very helpful. So it is, it just sort of builds a, uh, I mean, so you, the, the human mind is going to recognize color faster than it is going to yeah. parse text. So I try to make everything as smooth. I always use the same colors every time. I always use the same labeling every time I, you know, my mixing console, my drums are always blue. My vocals are always yellow. I'm building habits. I'm building 
uh, things that reduce variables because my job is to manage variables. So I want to reduce as many of them as I can. So this is one of the things that I do is uh, I always use the same colors. And so I can see exactly sort of gut level instinct, what data am I looking at here? And that prevents you from hopefully getting them mixed up and making bad decisions. But what we see here, the mic verify, yes, those mics are all giving us the same answer. So we can now feel confident moving those around the space and making some judgments on, on the differences between those measurements because they're all agreeing. So um, how do we pick our mic positions, right? This is something that as soon as anyone gets their hands on an audio analyzer, this is the first question you've got to answer. Where do, where do I put my mic? Um, and the answer is, what are you trying to measure? Because it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a voltmeter, right? What's a voltmeter do? It's going to tell you, you got to stick that probe somewhere in the circuit. It's going to tell you the voltage at wherever you put that probe. So you got to decide where you want to know the voltage before you stick the probes in. And a, and, a, and a mic is a test probe too. Again, show me the difference. That's our transfer function measurement, right? Show me the difference between what went into the PA and what's happening here at this location. So it's like the, the voltmeter probe. But we got to say, where do I want to measure from? And in an arena, you've got 13,000 seats. So we really can't realistically measure from all 13,000 seats. Uh, so we say we'll measure half. It's symmetrical. So now that it was 6,500 seats, I still can't do that. So we need to make targeted strikes. And we yeah. want to say, if I know what's happening at A, and I know what's happening at B, and I understand how A and B are interacting, then I know what's happening in between. So we want to make very deliberate decisions about where our microphones go and what decisions we're going to make at those points. And that will allow us to establish uniformity over very large numbers of seats, with only a couple of measurements. Perfect. So we want, to be, we want to be very deliberate here. So let's talk about array zoning. And so the, the trick with array zoning is, like I said, we've got every box on its own control. So we can do anything. I don't want to measure 19 mic positions for my 19 box hanging out. I don't want to do that. You could. And, you know, and if it was an install, you have more time and more freedom to do more granular things. But realistically, um, I'm on, on an arena level system. I'm typically working through that system in about 20 to 25 minutes. That's about the, the amount of time that I'm going to spend tuning it. And so we want to make maximum impact out of the measurements we're going to take. So I know exactly where I want to go, what I'm going to learn there, exactly where I'm going to go, the next position. So let's figure out the most valuable positions here. So this is my strategy. This is again, back to our, our little model here. You got our floor, our 100 level, our 200 level. Um, so what makes sense to me, because we can link these processors in any way we want, we're not mm -hmm. stuck on, I have four boxes, four boxes, four boxes, four boxes. If, if your amp structure dictates that to you, you really have no choice. But yeah. since I have a choice, I can create logical zones instead of electronic zones that are forced upon me by how the, the system mm -hmm. was driven. And so when we talked to you, you made, you made a great point last time about, oh, oh, you can get six boxes on an amp channel. Okay, well now I have to, those six boxes got to get EQ'd together. Yeah. And now my mic is going to have to go in the coverage of those six boxes, right? Yep. So the coverage area and the boxes and the mic position are all going to ride together. But the advantage of having more granular processing, one or two boxes per output, is that we can decide where we want those zones to lie. So the logical thing for me is, oh, I have a seating section here. I have a seating section here. And I've got mains and downfills on the floor. So yes. I've reduced this hang that's covering a 300-foot throw to four mic positions. Yep. If, if now, picture's worth a thousand words, this is worth a million. I think, for, <laughs> I think for anyone who is just like banging their head against the wall and like line arrays feel big and scary and I really can't jump from like point source to this and make sense of it, this just beautifully breaks that down. So yeah, so just just keep talking. <laughs> so now now I, there's a there's a there's an objection here, and it's a logical and reasonable objection, which is well, how do you know what's happening in between B and C? Hmm. There's a lot of space between B and C. It might be 70 feet between B and C. Yeah. So how do you know what's happening in between? And that's a great question. But here's the thing: if we have done our design right, mm -hmm. all four of these should look very, very similar. I know that I'm expecting less high frequency at A and more high frequency at D because of the throw distance and the air absorption, but that's really primarily the difference that I should be seeing. So if I see that progression where A has at least high frequency, B's got a little more, C's got a little more, D's got a little more, but they match other than that, that's a uniform design. And now I can just mm -hmm. balance those out and have uniformity. So if I know what's happening at A and B and C and D, and I know how they interact, I know what's happening in between without having to measure it. So the question is, is our design enabling us to do this? 
right? If we have a system that sounds different in every seat, has a different tonality in every seat, then this doesn't work. That's a yep. bad design. So, you, you, you know, you can't fix uniformity with EQ. Yep. yep. But if we've designed it to be uniform, then, then, then we know where we need to go. So let's take a look at this. This is what this actually looks like in practice, by the way. It's the same exact graphic, yeah. uh, but just with an actual photo of the system. So now you can see, yeah, I know exactly where my mics are going to go. B's kind of a special case in this particular. So I had to go back and find photos that, that I took from reasonable <laughs> angles to make this slide. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> and you can see B, there's a super reflective wall behind mixed position. So this is one of those things where you're like, there's nothing Oop. I can do about that yeah. other than be aware of its effects and be aware of how different mixed position sounds from everywhere else. So I can have that conversation with the mix engineer and say, this yeah. is what you're hearing. And this is not representative of what you're hearing everywhere else or whatever. Uh, and so maybe you don't want your mic right in front of that reflective wall, you know, so we want to use a little bit of common sense when, we, when we're putting a mic, but, sure. but I know, I know now roughly where those four mics can land. Yep. And so we've verified them. So I know they matched before we, we spread them out. So now let's see what they do. And so this particular data, um, I don't, I don't have the D you know, some days it was three zones, some days it was four. The D is the downfill. Um, often I would tune the downfill in after I've done the main hang. So what we're looking at here is the main hang A, B, and C downfills are not part of the party yet. Okay. Um, and, and it's exactly what I said. You can see a very, very small deviation between 125 and 200. And that's, you know, the LMBC um, mm -hmm. just doing its job and filling that, filling that gap up, you know, without that, you would see a much bigger deviation there. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you can sit there and tweak these algorithms. That's one of the things I really like about LMBC is it's not just an on or off button. Mm -hmm. Like some of these implementations, I can sit there and I can adjust the parameter a little bit and see if I can, get that to sit even better. Um, but what you can see is out of the box, we haven't done anything to this yet. And we are astoundingly uniform all the way down to the very, very bottom of the system. You know, obviously our subs are not on, but through the entire range of the system, we're like plus or minus 2 dB uh, all the way up to like 4K. And so it's exactly what we can see. That A needs some high frequency boost. C yeah. needs some high frequency cut, but we have a very uniform system. And this is just this the raw mechanics we talked about in our first conversation about this. This is line length. Yep. And splay angle. This is not processing. This is not, uh, you know, any advanced auto anything happening. This is just the mechanics of line array doing what a line array does. This is design. So this is this is how you know your design is doing what it should do. Um, and I and I, I might be beating it at horse, but this is very important. It because is because if you if this is your this is your ABC with no EQ and this is a mess. Yeah. You you're you've, you're past the point where you're going to get uniformity because your design wasn't good. So mm -hmm. this is kind of what I meant. Like the tuning is not really where the money is on this. This is a good design, and this is really easy. my mom could tune this. You know, and your mom's you go, a here's, lady. here's a, <laughs> she is, but she's not a sound engineer. So uh, here's here's the button for the high frequency on the top zone. Here's the button uh -huh. for the high frequency on the bottom zone, and here's a measurement of it. Like it's pretty easy now to, to yeah. get that where it needs to be, um, and. You know, even that what it is, you still only got what, you know, you're, you're 60 be down, 60 be up. Like you could probably walk away from this right now and you still have a very, very consistent sounding thing. Now we haven't put any other zones on yet. So I don't think you should do that. But the point is we're just going to kick this over the finish line. I love we're, it. we're in really good shape here. Right. So um, let's take a look at that. So the white trace is the target curve that I talked about. I grabbed it from our first show. And so every day we're going to tune the PA back to that target curve. I will bump that target curve up and down on the screen and smart the trace offset DB plus or minus. You can bump it up and down uh, until you get it lying on that shape uh, as close as possible. So you're going to need the least amount of EQ to hit it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so what we could see here is I really want to do kind of, it looks like we need a nice wide cut from like 250 to 800 or so. We've got this, the low mid's got to come down a little bit mm -hmm. and the high frequency has got to come up everywhere. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've got the high frequency variance and we've got that low mid cut. So let's put the low mid cut in. Okay. Mm -hmm. And again, that's one filter and it's a very, very subtle fill. It's probably two and a half dB cut. So one wide filter, two and a half dB just to get to the target curve of, of what the tonality of this particular show is. And that's an important note too. This target curve is not gospel. This is literally just the the choice of the mix engineers on this particular show. This is the tonality they requested. So there you go. So we put one filter in and above the sub range, we're looking great. Now we're going to go and do some shading. So we've got our ABC. So I can go into my A and I can, I can bump the high frequency up and I can go into the C and I can bump the high frequency down. And 
there we are. Okay. So again, I've done one EQ filter and I've done two zones of shading and this thing's ready to rock. This is, this is a incredibly uniform system. We didn't really do all that much to it. So this, this is paying its rent mechanically. Right. And how far is the distance like from the C throw distance to a, so you're talking like 150 feet to like 30 feet. Like, so that's a great question. I mean, we can look at some of this data. Um, yeah. And so remember that in smart, we have the, the delay, the, delay. Time, the measurement yeah. will tell you how far away it was. Typically speaking, um, your bottom measurements, your downfills, uh, the closest you're going to get, you're probably in the 25 to 30 millisecond range. Uh -huh. um, and that top row really depends on the size of the venue. Mm -hmm. um, it could be anywhere from 180 feet to 250 feet. Um, depending on the, uh, some of these arenas are, are pretty, are pretty good to throw. So you've got, you've got a pretty significant range ratio here that we've basically nullified. Um, now there's another conversation to be have about, do we want to get all the high frequency variants out? You can mm -hmm. see that my, my A zone is not quite back up. There's a couple of reasons for that. Number one is if you're sitting up there, it's 200 feet from the stage. It should sound like, it, you know, if, if it feels like it's here, um, there's psychological clues. We've we've really improved the direct to reverberant ratio and we've gotten rid of the level drop. So your brain is losing these clues that tell it this thing's far away. So you can make it like kind of feel pretty uncomfortable for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, if it feels like it's very close, but it looks far away, it just can be psychologically weird. The other thing is as that room fills up with people, the humidity is probably going to go up. And when the humidity goes up, that high frequency air absorption is going to become less severe. And so that, that top end is going to come back. Yep. And now it's going to be too bright up there. And so it's okay to let that sit a couple to be down because it's probably going to bump up a little bit when the show starts, we're going to walk up. And we're going to listen to it during the show, of course, and we're going to adjust it as we need. But what I found is, you know, why bother boosting it every night? And then you're going to go cut it back by a DB when the show starts, just skip, skip that step and yeah. just, you know, let it land. So, and this is where we talk about experience. I know, mm -hmm what yeah. these particular speakers will do in a venue of this size at this particular humidity. Yep. And so after a while, you just build a mental sort of database of these behaviors and you just kind of get a feel for that's probably going to come back by a DB or two, or it's, you know, it's really cold in here and the show didn't sell well. So the humidity is going to be low and it's probably not going to come back at all, or it's outside and humidity is going to drop and it's going to get worse. So you just have to have some experience to sort of anticipate what's going to happen. But the reality is, no one can anticipate it. The prediction software doesn't know. Um, we don't know. Our measurement doesn't know. At the end of the day, all we can do is make an educated guess until it actually happens. And then we're going to react to it. Right. Yep. Um, so there you go. We're at our target trace above the sub range. We've done our shading. So this looks good. Let's bring our subs on. So we're going to again, keep our mains up. There's our target trace. You can see we just got to fill in that octave there. Here's the subs. Okay. Um, and again, we know where the target trace is. And you can see that the subs... Uh, are actually pretty consistent. Like, you know, th that is a relatively small front to back drop um, given the proximities here, especially for a subwoofer. And I think a yeah. lot of folks, you know, are not used to experiencing that in the sub range. It's kind of an interesting listening experience because you're so used to those subs ramping up towards the front of the room. And this rig doesn't do that. Um, cool. So there's our, there's our subs. Let's bring them on together. And we're not looking at phase traces here, but again, we talked about how I was making those alignment decisions and you can see um that our orange trace, you know, it's a little bit down. Again, uh, that is because you have different seating architectures and you've got those, those weird things behind mix position and you've got that energy coming up off the floor. So um, you, you really are sort of at the mercy of the room and you're yeah. sort of at the mercy of the geometry when you're talking about venues that is large. Um, and in some ways, you're more at the mercy in smaller venues. Um, you know, sub range in a home studio is an absolute mess, right? So you can have plus or minus 12 peaks in there. Uh, but we know that we've designed it to reduce this as much as we can. And, you know, we still have got a, we still got a, a rather uh, consistent thing happening here. Um, yeah, so it's awesome. Now is the size. And we talked about this. So here's a target trace. Uh, this particular measurement of the side hangs is two microphones. I like got an upper and a lower because it was like a 100 level and 200 level. Um, and you can see that uh, you can tell the yellow one was the 100. And the pink was a 200 because the pink's lower in level and it's mm -hmm. got less high frequency. So everything there says, yeah, it's farther away. I can see that. Yep. Um, you also notice it does not have that low frequency ramp up um, to get to the target curve because you see it's basically flat. It's got a very gentle tilt, but I, I did not let it do that low frequency ramp up that we would expect from a large format array um, because of what we just talked about. So um, mm -hmm. 
it's going to interact with the mains and the sub when they're all in together. So let's not worry about that below 250. Let's just leave it alone. But above 250, let's work on our shading and our EQ. So you can see I've, I've brought it to target and we've done some shading to reduce that high frequency discrepancy. So it's now nice and consistent above there. And then when we turn our mains and subs back on, you see that it did fill in a lot of that energy down at the bottom. So here, the last, the last slide there, you can see that, yep, that stuff filled back in and we're way back up at target. And now if you want to go in to your low shelf and bump that side hang base up or down a DB or two and try to land that right on the target, you can. But the point is um, we've got to let the mains do a lot of that work because they are contributing a lot of that energy there. So we can't ignore that because if we tune it to target by itself and then we tune the whole thing on, we're going to get more than we wanted. Um, yep. And then we're going to be sending more of that everywhere else. So now it just, you know, now it's in the, in the mains. Um, so it's better to just let that system add what it needs down there. Perfect. Uh, now the fills, now the fills timing is tricky. Luckily we only got to do it once, right? Cause it's going to ride with the stage geometry. Um, but, uh, the thing we have to think about here is overlap because this is where timing decisions are meaningful to us. We care about timing where two systems are interacting. So the deal is we're going to not worry about the JM1Ps on the sides because for most shows, we don't need those. But we are going to look at this outer front fill. The outer front fill, the offstage front fill, is under the main hang. So as you're walking forward, you're going to go be in the coverage of the mains, and you're going to be in the coverage of the downfills, and then there's going to be a spot where you're hearing the downfill and the front fill together. So at that spot is where we want to make our timing decision between the hang and the fill. Now, obviously, the fill's on the ground, so it's closer, so it's earlier, so it's going to get delayed. Um, and we also want the people that are in that overlap zone to localize to the stage, not up to the array. So I want to let my front fill be a little bit early, like two milliseconds early, not a lot. 10 is way too much. You're going to have some effects that you probably don't want with 10, but I like two milliseconds early. Yeah, a little, some flaming stuff. Um, so I like to be about one or two milliseconds early because honestly, that's all it takes to shift your imaging. Mm -hmm. And from that point, if I walk backwards, I'm in the cover of the mains, the mains become dominant. So the timing is less important. And as I move forward from that point, I'm in the coverage of the front fill and the front fill becomes dominant. So the timing is less important. So it's really, there's a very small area there where we have an overlap. Once I have that timing, I want to move on stage because that fill is going to overlap with the, uh, the armpit fill here, right? So uh, the armpit fills run at a higher gain because of the geometry of the stage and the way the barricade is. Um, so that crossover is not halfway between them. It's closer to the uh, it's closer to the offstage fill. So again, we're going to walk until we get to that overlap. Set our timing there, and we want the armpit fill to be a little tiny bit early there, so we localize in to yep. the lead stinger. And then that tip fill at the end of the thrust does not overlap with the other fills at all. Again, remember that's not the that's not the design decision we would have made, but it's the design decision we had to make. Right? It's like yep. Batman; he's not the hero you. You want piece of hair you need or something like that. <laughs> this is the fill. This is the fill we want. So um, that guy actually, where he overlaps is if you walk sideways in that in that coverage, you start to pick up some energy from the downfills from the flown system. So there's a point off to the sides of that guy where you're starting to get the coverage from the flown system again. So that's where he times to. He Got times it. to that interaction. Um, and so this is sort of an example of where I made that. Uh, the that the ego riser fill there mm -hmm. against the downfill timing so you can see sort of where they mm -hmm. where they meet and where that timing and you see my colored x is there so the the talent doesn't get hurt um <laughs> right so yes, so I that's that's how that time relationship happens and then and then from there um we're adapting it from day to day right so yep. we talked about the weight the weight loading the center of gravity those are the things we need to keep track of um weird geometries so you're going to have a couple of these venues if you're in a touring situation you're going to have some venues that get some weird geometries um this is one of them. This is Ooh, a half yeah. arena. It was a sideways basketball court. So you see how close the stage comes to the inclined seating rake. Um, there's also, it's not very easy to see in this model, but there's a vertical line about two thirds of the way up the rake. There's a big billboard, a big video screen. And so we cannot Perfect. shoot through that. Um, and we have a very, very limited trim height. So the rigger said they thought I could get like 38 feet or something like that. So we have a very low trim. So we can't hang a lot of boxes. We're going to need a lot of curvature to get it down to the front. Um, we have sight lines. I can't hang a 25 foot line at a 36 foot trim. We're going to hit the lead singer in the head. So we need to be able to make a lot of curvature in a short line length. And since our trim is low, we need a wide coverage so we don't end up with the center gap because yep. we don't have the trim height that we usually have for it to open up. So because of that, I said, let's hang the lines in the front 
as, as, the, as the mains because they're wider and they're, they're a shorter box and they can open up more. They can open up all the way to nine. So we put the lines in the front and it solves all the geometric problems and yeah. allows us to get a better coverage um, at a lower trim height and still get that curvature. And so this is kind of that geometry and how that you can see we're kind of right on top of that. And if I trim any higher, I can't really get to these people that are behind the screen. Now, part of this is they shouldn't have sold that. So every day I get what's called a sold map and it shows where the seats have been sold. And I use that to design mm -hmm. if there's seats that we just can't cover. Like if they were all the way up behind the billboard, you have to go to your production manager and say, these people can't hear and they can't see, and we need to do something. We need to move those seats. Um, in this case, they didn't do that. They had sold, you know, there was a clear demarcation of where they had sold back to. And I said, I know what my trim height needs to be in order to hit those seats. Because if you sold the seat, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure they can hear the show from that seat, right? Yeah. There are always people who will go somewhere else and they will sit way over on the side, like behind the monitor yes. desk or, or we'll go up to the 300 level, even though it's not open. And then it's like, Hey, I didn't, you know, you weren't sold that seat. So if you want to go sit somewhere else and you can't hear that's on you, but if we sold you the seat, we're going to cover you. Uh, and I'm going to do whatever I need to do to make sure you can hear that. And so all these things together go, look, I got to trim pretty low. We need a lot of curvature. Let's put those lines in the front. Um, this is the prediction. You can see that we're barely closing our center gap down front at four. Yeah. So using that wider box, using the line instead of the Leo here um, is, is the move. Right. Absolutely. And this is what I'm talking about using the tools that we have, not just saying, uh, well, the Leo's are our mains, hang those. Like mm. if you've, it may it make sense to hang a line as the main today, hang line as the main. So use, figure out what's on your truck, figure out what you have at your disposal and figure out the most logical way to solve these problems, with what you have. And that's an evaluation that I'm making every day. Right. Um, awesome. So here's some photos of that. And you can see that we're, we're hung pretty low. Um, That's very low. Wow. Yeah. So we're also very, very close to the stage. We're about, I think we're about 40 feet from my barricade to their barricade. So we're right on top compared to we've been at 115 feet for, for 20 shows. Now all of a sudden you're right on top. They actually, you see they, they shortened the stage thrust there um, mm -hmm. and shorter. Um, one thing that I did differently is I changed the front fill timing. And for this show, that front fill was time to front of house. So it got to mix position the same time as the flown system did. And the reason is when you're this close, the mix engineers are going to hear that. It's yeah. pointed right at their face. You can like Whereas high five hundred feet seen. out. Yeah, there's there's a lot of human meat between the, that fill and, and mix position usually. But in this case, that's something that could very well be audible. So mm -hmm. I changed the timing of that. Um, and that is kind of what it looked like. And you can see that there's our, there's our Leos at, at, as the side hangs. Um, nice. So, so that's, that's an example of, of just kind of adapting and thinking about the best way to use what you have to, to get the coverage you need. Um, and you can see from these, these photos where, you know, they are right on top. They're right on top of that. They're, they're getting up under the PA. Um, the riggers, they come back to me and say, look, we can trim up higher if you want to. We got more trim height than we thought. And I said, no, because you're already sort of getting mixed position under the subarray. And as you go up higher, you're taking that energy further uh, off mix. And so you're kind of putting them into a less and less representative position as that pH trims up. So uh, since everybody was happy with that and the coverage was good, we decided to leave it. Yep. Um, this, is, this is kind of a nice little brain teaser. I think this is a good thing to kind of end on. Um, this is a venue that is basically a regular arena, except that it does not have a back wall seating. There's just a solid back wall where there would usually be a bull. Um, of seats. And I think it's a rodeo. So there might also be a, there might be a different kind of bowl uh, running around, but this is, there's, there's nice. no seating bowl on the rear wall. There's just, a, <laughs> there's just, there's just a, uh, there's just a wall and everything in our being as sounds as designer says, we don't want to hit that wall because it's going to be super reflective. Um, and so the problem is how do you address this? This is what the prediction looks like. Um, and if you look at what that energy is doing, this is just the mains. Okay. We don't have side hangs on yet. You see that if we aim downward to try to avoid the back wall, or we shade down our top boxes to try to keep energy off the back wall, I'm going to be penalizing a ton of people who are in the coverage of those boxes on the side. Yep. Those people up in the corner need that energy. So we cannot aim down. We cannot shade down without generating refunds up on the sides. And those are, those are sold seats. So we have to cover those sold seats and the room's going to be a little more lively than we would like, but we didn't pick the room. 
you know, uh, we have to cover the seats that were sold. And so what you realize here is by trying to steer away from a room boundary, you're going to take a massive uh, coverage hit for a lot of people. And so the only answer is let it, let it be what it is. You know, you have to cover those seats and uh, you need to just realize that, Hey, it's going to be, it's going to be a little bouncy in here tonight. And again, that's a conversation with the mix engineer to have yep. is, you know, you're going to, you're going to get more of that energy, even back on stage, you're going to get more of that back to your vocal mics. And, and, you know, you've got a gigantic reflective surface. Um, but with what we have, you know, again, unless you want to fly a separate delay hang, which we don't have the ability to do, um, you have to cover those seats. And so this is again, a, a perfect reason to use your prediction tools because it'll show you exactly what's going to happen and, and are those seats covered. And, and what you can see is, you know, we are actually rolling off a bit as we go up, as we go up those seats. Um, and then our side hang has, a, has, it's clear where the side hang is going to take over and do its thing. But uh, when you get these weird geometries, um, we got to remember that we got to cover the people that, that paid for the ticket, even if, uh, even if that means we get some energy on the wall. So, so we want to reduce energy on the walls, but not at the expense of paying customers. Sure. You know, I mean. um, and then uh, I've got this, this video that these are two, two guys who were up in the 200 level and they were just having a great time. And when I, when I have people shadow me at shows or when I train people, I like to point that out. And you see these people that are way, way, way up in these, in the, mm -hmm. we call them the cheap seats, but from an audio perspective, they're most expensive ones to cover, right? They require the most gear. Um, <laughs> you know, that's funny. you've got these that. people, see, see those people, they're enjoying that show. That's our job. Yeah. You got to think that. about these people when you go, uh, yeah, you know, we're not going to cover those seats or, Hey, it's going to be, it's not going to sound good in the seats. Cause, cause we don't, you know, I don't want to go up there and bring, I don't want to bother bringing my measure and my call the way up there. I don't want to bother walking all the way up there to listen, do it. That's your job because mm -hmm. of those people, you know, who are going to, who are going to sit there and, and save their money to come to that show and waited for months to come to that show and wore the t-shirt cause they were excited and we want to give them the best experience we can. And that's why we got hired. Yep. Right. So, so I like to see what the audience is doing. And that's one of those things where I really like the part of my job where I get to walk. Mm. I walk during the sound check. I walk during the support. I walk during the headline. Uh, as soon as front of house is comfortable, hey, I'll see you. I'm going for a walk. And I'll go listen to every zone. And it'll take me 10 minutes and I'll come back. And then everything's good at that point. Then you can relax a little bit. But sure. not only am I checking out what the system's doing, but I also want to see the people. I want to see those people mm -hmm. that are having a great time. And I want to, I will sit as a fan. I will go up to 300 level and sit down and watch the song and just see what that audience experience is like, because that's, yeah. that's why we're doing that work. That's why someone's signing my paycheck to have me out and do that work is to make that experience, uh, you know, as good as it can be. So I, I love to go walk and I love to sit down and watch the show and, and try to put the technical stuff out of my mind for 30 seconds and just enjoy it. Uh, and then if you need to go back and make an adjustment, you go back and make an adjustment. But um, that is sort of the payoff for doing all of the stuff all the way up to that point, which is that you go, you know, I think it was great when one of our lighting techs said, Hey, I was up in 300. He's man, it sounded like the front row up there. Um, That's awesome. So yeah. for a lighting tech, you know, they're not really paying attention to the coverage of the system in the way that we are for them to make that comment, I was like, yeah, you know, that's cool. That's why mm -hmm. we're doing this. That's why we're putting so much effort into trying to get this right is because you had that experience. And that's, that's the experience we're trying to give. I love that, man. Just seeing how every piece of the puzzle of this Rubik's cube you're putting together, the systems come together. You're taking requests from the band, you have production budgets, you have venue challenges, you have gear, you have to work around other departments. So you have to think about changes from day to day and you're just somehow moving it all together with the tools that you have to, and that's your outcome. And I bet that's gotta be such a gratifying experience to help put together for people. That's why you do, do this job. <laughs> it is. And, and, you know, there are so many factors that push against you and yeah, try to oh make it word. cheaper and try to make it faster and try to make it lighter and try to make it use less power. And, and those are all real forces. And it's somebody's job to make sure the band can afford to stay on tour and that the band can afford to do another tour and they can afford to pay you. So that, that's a real thing. And I'm not going to disrespect a production mm. manager or a business manager whose job it is to make sure that the artist stays profitable because yep. otherwise we all have to go home. Yep. <laughs> yeah, but, absolutely. But it's my job to advocate for that show. Yeah. So if yeah. I have uncovered seats or I take a walk in the morning, yeah. you know, one of the first things I like to do when I get into the venue before I even take my measurements of, of the space, I like to just walk around the seats. And if I find a problem with the seating geometry 
or I know there's going to be a problem with a, a front fill placement or anything that could impact the show for those paying customers. Mm-hmm. It's my responsibility to say, hey, uh, we got an issue here and we need to talk about yeah. this because if I don't bring it up, who's going to bring it up? Yeah. Right. I, I need yeah. to advocate for that. And so I think sometimes it can feel like you're agitating or like you're being a squeaky mm-hmm. wheel, but my job is to advocate for that show. My job mm-hmm. is to make sure the artist experience is, is what they're trying to deliver. And I know from experience that if I don't go, hey, these seats should, are not in the coverage of a of a speaker and these people aren't going to be able to hear. Yeah. If I don't say that no one else is going to bring that to anybody's attention. Production yeah. management may still very well go. Yeah. It's thank you for telling me, but I, there's nothing I can do about it. Or thank you for telling me, but we're going to let it be what it is. That's their call. And mm-hmm. they can be responsible to the artist for that call, but I'm responsible for raising that concern because if I don't do it, it's not going to get raised. So yeah, um, that's part of my job is, you know, I, I have had a lot of conversations with the, the promoter reps and going, you sold these three seats are going to be out of coverage. You know, the side hang is going to stop on row M and you sold to row, row O or, you know, it might be two or three mm-hmm. seats, but I, I, you still know where it's going to land and do the best you can to cover it. And then if I, if I can't cover it, I'm going to let somebody know so they can make a decision. That's great. I love that attitude of advocacy along every step, making sure you get that outcome. I, I would love for you to end with something we, we talked about offline. That's it's one thing to look at, this giant 135 box design and be like, wow, that's a big reg. That's, that's really cool. But I think something you really hammered home is like, this is all based in a pragmatic approach that is grounded in fundamentals. So how can you help make sure that those of us who may be just working with a couple of speakers on sticks and subs can, can, right. can walk away from this feeling like learn more than like, that's a cool rig. Well, I mean, I think that's the real message here is that, you know, I approach speakers on sticks the same way. I approach mm-hmm. eight little boxes per side the same way. I'm still going for as much uniformity as I can get based on, on the, on the design constraints. Yep. The whole job is saying we're going to do the best we can with what we have. Yeah. And sometimes part of that job is saying, if you give me this, this, or this, I can make it a little bit better. Mm-hmm. But, but really it's, you know, a lot of speakers on sticks. I saw people don't aim them right. <laughs> or I see people that they didn't, they didn't have left and right don't match, or they didn't check their the little presets on the back and they, they have different presets. So there are a lot of things that we can do mm-hmm. to maximize the uniformity within the constraints of our tools that we have available. Yep. Um, aiming is huge. Placement is huge. So even if we can't get the gear that we want, we can say, what do we have? What is the way to arrange these things and to process these things and to time these things to make it as uniform as possible with what we have. And that's always the job. Don't yep. think for a second that on an arena level tour or a stadium level tour, there's no budget. It, the, the budget cuts are even more severe and more stringent. When you talk about budget cuts, you lose eight boxes or 16. You lose a lot of stuff yeah. very quickly. Um, and so there's always a budget and there's always a, this is what I wanted, but this is what we have. And that never goes away. So I think the thing is to always say, let's be realistic about what we have, what are our options, and let's just use our knowledge of how these things are going to work to make it as good as it can be. I love it, man. Thank you so much, Michael. If if, if you're watching and want to dive deeper into this approach, even more, Michael, depending on when you're watching this, has a, has a book out or is releasing very soon. And that's going to be available at the link below, uh, taking you to Michael's link tree. He has a wealth of knowledge. Um, he's active on pro sound web you could hire him as an independent contractor uh, there's a great discord community for the signal to noise podcast where i've learned a ton of stuff from him so please make sure and hop in and interact with him in those ways and definitely grab his book and put it to work michael thank you so much for sharing everything you've learned on this tour both in design processing and alignment and i hope your next tour goes fantastic thank you thank you for having me <laughs>